get started, everyone. My name is Joyce Raimondo, and I am here at the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. And we're located about 100 miles east of New York City. And we have a really special presentation today. As part of our uh, current exhibition, <laughs> we have the work of Terence Netter. And we're gonna have a tour and a presentation about Netta's work. And we have a special guest speaker today, Sean McNiff, who uh, has explained to me, and uh, the story will unfold, that Terence of Netter was uh, one of his very important mentors. And uh, Mr. McNiff is the author of several uh, acclaimed books about the creative process. And I will introduce him later, and he's going to share his thoughts about creativity, healing, and his relationship with Netter, and how, why this man and this artist was such an inspiration to him. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And I'll tell you a good story about his book later. I'm going to save that, okay? So what I would like to do now is I will walk you just around the installation so you can get an idea of uh, Terence Netta's paintings. Um, but then I'm gonna actually show some of his works on a PowerPoint because they just show up better on Zoom. But um, just to give you an idea, this is in the home of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. And so we have a combination of artifacts that were in the house when Pollock and Krasner lived here such as that anchor. And then we have our current exhibition of paintings by Terence Netter. And I'm gonna explain his process and a little bit about his life as we go along. And I also wanna hear your opinions because this is abstract art and abstract art is open to interpretation. Okay. Okay, now before we start, um, I would like to um, highlight the special relationship that Jackson Pollock's wife, Lee Krasner, who was a very important painter, I'd like to highlight the special relationship that Lee Krasner had with Terence Netter and how it came to be that this site uh, became a national landmark and a museum and study center in East Hampton. And Netta was uh, played a very important role in that. So I am going to screen share this is a clip of our director and curator of the exhibition, Helen Harrison, explaining a little bit about the relationship. Deepest gratitude to Teresa Netta and her generosity, her help, her kindness has just been instrumental in putting this show together. It is really an honor for us to be able to present Terry's work because if it weren't for Terry, there would be no Paula Krasner House and Study Center. He met Lee Krasner in 1964 when he was a Jesuit priest and an art student at Georgetown University. He was always interested in art, even before he went into the priesthood, or right from his, his young days, and he was taking a course with a, a guy named uh, Alex Russo, who brought his students to the Hamptons to meet some of the artists up in this area. And one of the artists they came to visit was Lee Krasner. And Terry went into the house, and as you see, the, the wall behind Joyce, where there's the long, narrow Netter painting, at the time, there was a Lee Krasner painting there. And it was a one of the paintings from her Night Journey series, which is a very dark, turbulent kind of imagery. Her mother had died. It was a few years after Jackson Pollock. Her husband had died. And she was having insomnia. So she painted at night. And she didn't want to use bright colors. So she painted these very umber-colored paintings. And Terry saw the painting. And instead of saying, that's what I think about it, he asked her her thoughts about it. He said, how does this painting make you feel? And she used a vulgar word, uh, which I won't use, and Terry always asked me not to repeat it, but she said, it scares the hell out of me. And he said, I like you, let's have dinner. And from then on, they developed a wonderful friendship. They had a great deal in common uh, 
in, in term in creative terms, although they were very, very different personalities. But throughout their lives for the next 20 years, they kept in touch. And when Terry was recruited to become the founding director of the Stoller, what's now the Stoller Center at Stony Brook, he encouraged Stony Brook to make the connection with Lee. He arranged a, a special award for her from the Stony Brook Foundation. And then four years later, just before her death, he engineered a, an honorary degree for her. So that was what cemented the, the relationship. She was introduced to the president of the university. They got along very well. And then after her death, when her estate was looking for a place to manage the house and the study center, Stony Brook seemed like the natural option. So it was thanks to Terry and his relationship with Lee that that was able to, to come about. And the property was deeded to Stony Brook in 1987. And we opened as a museum uh, the following year. And ever since then, Terry has had been, until his death in 2018, a great supporter, a great um, shoulder to cry on sometimes, <laughs> great for advice. and just a very, very uh, understanding colleague, friend, and mentor. So from that point of view, having an exhibition of his work is a posthumous tribute to him, to his life and career, and also to his instrumental relationship with Lee and with Stony Brook University. So that's really the impetus for the show. And these are all works from the 1990s. It, it kind of reprises an exhibition that was done for him at Stony Brook on his retirement in 1997, which was called Visions and Revisions, because all of these works are revisions of earlier works. Now this, so this is called Visions and Revisions Revisited. So I hope that you will enjoy your tour with Joyce. Aw, thank you so much, Helen. Important to acknowledge really the tremendous uh, uh, contribution of Terence Natter in um, helping to create this, this, um, this public space. And I always also like to highlight the giving nature of artists and how their contributions go beyond the creation of the art itself. Um, but being a teacher, um, his impact has been very far reaching. So we're gonna have, share some of that today with our author, Sean McNett. So what I would like to do is show some of the images um, on PowerPoint of Terence Netta's work and talk a little bit about his process, okay? And this is not a lecture. Um, I will ask you to share some of your thoughts about the work and what it means to me, uh, you. Because as you heard, uh, Mr. Netta said uh, to Lee, what are your thoughts about this artwork? So in that spirit, I'm going to ask some people to share their ideas. So um, I love this quote that Terence Netta um, repeated, which Hegel said originally, art is the nature, no, excuse me, art is nature reborn through the sensuous expression of the human spirit. Art is nature reborn through the sensuous expression of the human spirit. So uh, let's look at some of these artworks and see what that might mean. So here is a work uh, by Terence. And this is an example of how he reworked a former artwork. So underneath those black lines, you see a uh, color and paint that sort of swooshed around and he lays out the color and then he would sometimes put a piece of newspaper over the wet paint and pull it up to get an unexpected result. Now, years later, Terence revisited these artworks and completely reworked them, painting the hard edge lines over the image that you see. And he even put a collage element in the corner which is like a, a computer, a piece of debris from a computer, okay? This one is really interesting. It's called Harvest Moon. And here you see the painterly 
uh, painting that was painted first on, over the entire canvas. You see the pinks and the greens and the maroons and the whites. And years later, uh, Terence paint over that to uh, create these hard edge leaves. So you see the blue part would have been painted after the underpainted. But he doesn't stop there. This is what the painting looks like today. And this is an installation shot that Helen Harrison took. So who can tell us, here's the first painting. Here is his reworking. How has it changed? Anybody want to unmute and tell us? Jump right in so I'm not doing all the talking. Johnny? Anybody uh, else? I think, can you hear me? Yes. I, I, I like the brighter colors first, better. And it looks like a bunch of leaves to me, but I preferred it the way it was before. I liked the, the uh, I said the brighter, livelier blue. And the other one I think had more pink in it. And this is more yellow and orange, really like a leaf, leaf color. They look like leaves to me. Yeah, well, they do, they are leaves. And I have to tell you that change in color is actually in the photography, not so much the painting. Oh. Okay. What else is different? That Anybody lower else? right corner is different too. Yeah, here he has the harvest moon and it's a small moon in the upper right. And yeah. here he, he has it enlarged in the lower right corner. And also, of course, he completely changed the orientation of the painting. Here it's horizontal, yeah. right? Yeah. And here it's vertical. So uh, Sean is gonna be talking later about the creative process, right? And sometimes in creativity, you might say you have to destroy in order to create, right? You sometimes have to be bold in your, in your desire to create excellence, right? And maybe rethink of a work from your past and have the boldness to, to completely change it. Um, so this one, um, these paintings were done in the late 60s. And this is the period when Sean McNiff was a student of Terence Netters. And here we see this technique before it was worked over where he, he lays out the color, as I said, puts newspaper on it and then lifts it up to get these surprise um, images. Now this one you could see here in its first form. And then here is the painting years later reworked. So you see, this is the underpainting. And then he painted the uh, yellowish color over it and the lines and the other circular form on the lower right. Oh. This one we have in the exhibition, um, also done in the same technique. You could see it's worked over with these hard edge shapes. And I'm curious, uh, let's take an interpretation of this one. What does this remind you of? Who would like to unmute and tell us? Anybody? There's no right or wrong answers. I think it looks like a kaleidoscope, really pretty. The way all the colors spin around. Yeah, Shani, I've heard other people say that as well. Or stained glass. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Anybody else? Um, what's interesting is you said stained glass and um, I didn't mention, which is a really, really important part of Terence Netta's life. He was a Jesuit priest. And then later on, he left the priesthood to marry. And um, I think a lot of his artworks, to me, this is my own personal interpretation. They have a spiritual quality to them without literally representing a spiritual or religious icon. So what I mean by that, to me, this almost looks like, this is just my own interpretation. It reminds me of form sort of coming out of, ma of, of energy, of like a universal energy and like giving birth to form in those hard edges. 
but constantly changing and yet unified at the same time. This is another painting from the exhibition, which you can see um, the hard edge combined with the painterliness. And um, I'm gonna stop this screen share now. I wanna just show you in real time these, these paintings in the, um, in the exhibition. So this one is really beautiful. And I think you can see it close up here. Um, the technique and how he created these beautiful textures. And this is when the paint was wet, he would then press the newspaper, lift it up, paint back into it. And in this case, years later, he painted this dark border around it. You see that? And last time when we were discussing this work, the issue came up, how much of this is intentional or how much of it is random and how much is you know, the artist control, so to speak. And this is what I love about abstract expressionism, which is this painterly styled and abstract art. But you could probably say this about a lot of art. Um, it's the idea that the artist is using his or her intuition. And Jackson Pollock used to say, I let the painting lead right? The painting has a life of its own. And many artists report this, the idea that they're not working from a sketch or planned with a preconceived idea, right? Accidents might happen. Unexpected things might happen with the paint. And you're not doing a painting. The artist is not painting something that's completely random, although there are some artists who work that way, but this is not the case with Terence Netter. Um, there's a balance between spontaneity, surprise, and also the artist's determined hand and decision making. Okay. And here's another one, which you can see here again the same process with a combination of hard edges and then the underpainting, which is very painterly. Okay. Now, this segues perfectly. And we'll continue with our after hour. Um, everybody, please mute yourself. We're going to take a, a little housekeeping break here. So can everybody make sure you're muted? Let me see. Oh, yes, we have quite a few people. So, OK. OK, good. All right, so um, this leads us to our wonderful guest speaker today, Sean McNiff. So I'm gonna tell you a little short story about how I feel sometimes the universe just provides the right, right opportunities at the right time. So I was going about my day and I went, actually, Sean, your book was at the recycling center, okay? Where there's an area where people leave things so other people can pick them up. And in East Hampton Recycling Center, you find some really good things. But anyway, it was completely random. I was just running errands and I look down and I see the cover of this book. It says, trust the process. I said, trust the process, that sounds good. The art of letting go. And I said, that is exactly what I need to hear right now. That's exactly what I need in my life. And so I took the book home and every night before I went to sleep, I would read this book. And I said, this is, this is so great. This is like exactly like, you know, the abstract expressionists and Pollock and Krasner and this idea of letting go and trusting the creative process I was just explaining. But to me, the, really the book meant more than that. I really, it helped me reflect not only on the artistic process, but the process of being a human being and this beautiful, dance between having goals, having aspirations, right? Having a plan and at the same time, letting go and surrendering and just let one moment lead and flow into the next, right? So that life is balanced. And sometimes I have a hard time. I tend to be more of a really hard worker. So I really can't hear that message enough. So I wanna thank Sean for writing that book. 
Now, then what happened was I was like, oh, maybe he'd want to speak at the Pollock House. So I called him or emailed and he got back to me. And it was just a pure coincidence that the Terrence Netter show was about to come up. And Sean McNiff said, Terrence Netter is really an important mentor in my life. I would love to speak. So it was, you might say this was all serendipity, right? So uh, Sean is an author of several books about creativity and also about how art heals. And um, you could find those titles online, Sean McNiff. And he is also um, university professor of emeritus at Leslie, and he lives in Cape Ann, Massachusetts. In addition to being an author, he's an artist in his own right. So let's welcome Sean McNiff. Ready, Joyce? Yes. Yes. All yours. So, um, uh, nice job, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Please pardon my uh, wound here. Uh, uh, wear your sunscreen. <laughs> Uh, I'm a great uh, role model for, uh, especially if there are any young people in the group, wear your sunscreen when you're young. The um, Joyce, uh, Joyce just hit on so many of the fundamental uh, qualities of art healing. And uh, as she did in an earlier Get Acquainted conversation that we had, uh, the, the fundamental one that I'd like to emphasize now at the beginning it ties into Terry, it ties into, uh, you know, the magnificent uh, Jackson Pollock, who I think uh, arguably uh, uh, unrecognized as one of the great philosophers of art as well as, as a painter. But the point I'd like to start with is that art and the creative process, the creative imagination is an intelligence. It's an ingenious intelligence. <laughs> That, as I found in, in my life work, it's a paradoxical, often perverse one that always functions a step or two ahead of the reasoning mind. And it helps us access uh, uh, transformative life qualities and insights into our lives uh, that, that simply aren't, aren't possible through the logical reasoning mind as important is that, as that faculty is. Uh, I, I came to this work, uh, I, uh, or I should say, I would not be in this work if it wasn't for Terry Netter and a serendipitous meeting uh, that I uh, ha had with him when I was an undergraduate student at Fordham from 1964 to 1968. And he, of course, at that time was a Jesuit and a painter. And I believe in the, uh, in the, uh, in the fall of my senior year, uh, I took his course uh, on aesthetics. And, um, and, and, and let's just say that everything I do today in the arts and therapy can be traced back to those influences with Terry that were resonating with, with what was fundamental and indigenous to me in terms of my sense of how art heals. Joyce talked about this intelligence. She also talked about the energy of art. And, uh, and Terry in his website, you saw already a bit at the beginning of her presentation, talks about, uh, uh, you know, art is nature reborn from Hegel. And of course, Jackson Pollock talked about, I am nature. Art is a force of nature a fundamental transformative and healing one that takes our afflictions and does something positive with them. It takes our afflictions, uses them as fuel and energizes our lives. And as Nietzsche said, it emerges as a healing sorceress when all else fails. Only art can take the things that are most difficult in our lives and help us live productively with them. So that was the formative um, a base of, uh, of my vision of art healing that, that, that all started through the connection with Terry. Uh, it, it, I don't want to get into too much detail as to how he was the invisible hand in terms of how I found myself in this work 
that I've been doing for the last 52 years. I was a history major on the way to law school. And, uh, and, and, and Terry, in, in his classic way, when I was at Fordham, realized, realized that I utilized all the resources that were on the Rose Hill campus in relation to art. And as, as the expert organizer, as, as he's proven in his life as an arts administrator at Stony Brook and other places, he went to the dean of the college and said, we have to find a way for this young man to, to, to go to the Art Students League of New York so he can do more with, with the arts. And to make a long story short, I wound up with Theodoro Stamos, a, a great profound influence on my life. Uh, and, 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 and a few years later, found myself once again, accidentally in this work uh, of the arts and therapy, which I've uh, been so closely involved with internationally for, for the last uh, 52 years. Now, in terms of how art heals, uh, the, the topic of the conversation today, it is a paradoxical healing process, and that's why it is so effective. Art does not heal through this um, often stereotypic diagnostic approach of looking at a painting and finding your problem in it. Uh, as, as we say, uh, uh, whatever you do, whatever you paint can and will be used against you. You see it, you saw it, and in in this is otherwise wonderful book that these two fellows did. The, you know, I, I wrote an essay on it at the first request of one of the journals when it came out in 1989. But they talk in classical reductionism, they reduce Jackson Pollock's uh, drip paintings to childhood memories of his father Roy urinating on a rock. Similarly, uh, we know about the arts and, arts and uh, psychiatry history. You know what people said about Georgia O'Keeffe's um, uh, uh, flower paintings, always reducing them to uh, female um, uh, genitalia. And as, as Georgia said to them, you are talking about your own affairs. You are not talking about me. These, uh, these, these reductions of art to something pathological that's still very much alive in the whole art and therapy, art and uh, psychology, art and therapy way, because uh, we human beings are hardwired, hardwired to reduce and to, and, and to tell me what's wrong, doc. <laughs> and so I can go out and fix it. Uh, our healing is not a matter of fixing. It's, a, it's, it's transforming. It's putting the affliction to use as art and tragedy have done throughout time. Some years ago, Terry wrote to me, we'd lost touch after college, and I'm not, I'm not one to be writing, uh, writing to people as uh, my uh, close community people know. He wrote to me and he said, Sean, I've been fascinated with your career in art and therapy, art and healing, because my art always tore me apart. I mean, this is one of the things like the, this, this statement that he made uh, that is uh, the, the foundational to the work I do and that, I, that I've always emphasized in the world of art and healing, that insight that he had. And I didn't wanna be a, a smart aleck with Terry, but sometimes we need to be torn apart, as Nietzsche said, break, break, break in order to make anew. And, and that's what art does. Forget about all this, this de deconstructionism business of today. I keep saying that deconstructionism, that cliche has to deconstruct itself. But the creative process literally is a breaking down. It's a breaking through. It's a, um, it's a dissolution of often dysfunctional ways of being and out of that crucible of the creative act, out of the act, the act as nature. Nature, she, they, all of them make themselves anew. My work in art and healing really did come out of those experiences with Terry. He was, it, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for his quote intervention in my life. And, um, and, and, and reinforcing uh, 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 myself as a person that could contribute uh, uh, to art. 
And from the very beginning, my vision of art healing has been based in the core values of, of abstract expressionism, that era of, of the 1960s uh, when I was in New York City, even though, of course, I, I paint in response to nature and I paint figures as Pollock did. And I would argue that some of his best work, of those earlier dark writerish, writer uh, a figurative, um, uh, a figurative works. So I feel that 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 core, you know, as, as I keep saying, to help people because people everywhere resist expression. You know, I've had the opportunity to work throughout the world, and people everywhere. Uh, it, it's like our healing everywhere involves this transformation of affliction into an affirmation of life. Our healing everywhere involves. Uh, uh, a re-energizing and re bringing of creative vitality with East, what East Asians call chi, that life force into, your, into our lives. Art healing it involves that energizing not only in lives but in communities. But it's, but it's, 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 it, it, it's a fundamental uh, uh, acting in sync with nature, as Pollock said, I am nature, I would say that art is nature. I've written about uh, art, uh, artistic expression as a force of nature, because everywhere I go, people say, I can't do that. I'm not talented. Uh, uh, she's talented over there, or, or he over there, or they, they and them over there, but it, it's not me, I can't do it. And so the inhibitions to artistic expression the fears and the vulnerabilities are profound and, and they're worldwide, as I said. They are as indigenous to human experience as uh, those transformative processes of art healing. So how do I deal with this in the work I do? I, I, I keep saying, if you can move, you can paint. You know, once again, <laughs> You know, I don't want to uh, over, overly simplify Jackson Pollock and, and his marvelous dancing, as you see the film of him working in the drips and his, uh, his movement was just beautiful. He was an athletic person and the movement was just beautiful. If you can move, you can paint. And what, you, what, what I want you to do, I say to people everywhere, go, go online, look at some of the films that have been made around the world. This wonderful one at the Art Thera London Art Therapy Center with 120 people all painting together in a big studio that we did here. If you just move, if you can make a gesture, so I write about it and trust the process. If you can make a gesture and keep making it, <laughs> that's the key. As John Cage said, if you're bored after two or three minutes, do it for six. If you're bored after six, do it for 12. And before you know it, it becomes fascinating. The key is sustaining that gesture with a trust, with a trust in the process that, some, that the hand thinks, that the arm and the hand and the body are the instant, and, and the mind follows. <laughs> the mind doesn't control. As Pollock said, I could when he was asked, does he ever envision pictures in advance? And he said, how can I envision it? It hasn't happened yet. You can never know the end at the beginning. In the human experience, the human community is hardwired to think in the reverse, to always have control, to always know in advance. So I say to people, quality painting, and believe me, I've, I like the joke that I'm a database of thousands of people every year before the pandemic happened. I'd be traveling around the world doing these studio groups of people and I see it everywhere. If people can move with conviction, with authenticity in ways that are completely unique and indigenous to them, they, they, they tap into a universal, it's not popular these days to talk about universal human experience. Another, another feature of my, my early studies with Fordham, interestingly enough, it was a crazy time with Marshall McLuhan was there at the time and Thomas Berry was my teacher of East Asian religions. And Thomas Berry is, 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 the, is the great figure on the great work and, 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 and the earth community and how we could tap into something an ecosystem of the earth and creativity that holds us all and that needs us all, that literally needs the individual things we do to realize, as he would call the great work and the work of the human community working together. So we tap into that human community. There's a profound sense of art healing and, 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 and dignity in that happening in this space 
came to this through the back wards of a state mental hospital. We tap in to that universality of the human community while affirming the absolute uniqueness of each person's innate natural expression. If, as Joyce said earlier, if we can let go, and as Jackson Pollock would say, every good painter, all good painters, all good painters ultimately paint themselves, themselves, their own unique movement, which is them and all of us. So God bless Terry and, um, and Teresa. I mean, I'm just honored uh, to, to do this, uh, uh, reflecting on him. Uh, these ideas came from there. I was fortunate in, in that I was not a psychology major in college. Uh, the psychology department then was all psychometrics and the antithesis of the scientizing of, uh, of the psyche and everything that's antithesis to everything I do. And so I was, I was very lucky that my, that my formation came uh, from Terry Netter, uh, Thomas Berry, uh, Vivian Thal Wechter, the artist in residence at Fordham. And I've continued that vision of um, the art base of art healing worldwide. And, and we've had some success in, uh, in that as a counter argument for the silly reductionism. It's very odd, as I talked to you about, you know, X shapes are Xing out sexual impulse. I mean, it's weird stuff. And yeah, it's all part of this explanationism it's, uh, that so many people feel that they need and experts feel that they need in order to be authoritative and tell you this and tell you that about yourself. It's a, it's, it's, in reality, art healing and art making is a, is a, is a descent, is a descent, as my beloved James Hillman would say, is a descent into the unknown. And, and, and people are afraid to do that. And they need help, they need support. And that's what I've been doing in my life work. And so, uh, God bless Terry. And uh, it, it, is a little, it is a little strange because uh, Joyce didn't tell you that I was busy and I didn't get back to her for a couple of months. <laughs> I got back and, and I discovered also that the exhibit was there and I said, oh my goodness is another one of the Fordham Jesuits. These synchronicities are God's way uh, of acting an, an anonymously. Mm -hmm. I think he got that from um, Billy Wilson, you know, and the Oxford group. The I have a question for Sean, if that's OK. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, Helen? Yeah, I have a question about the role of magic in all of this. I mean, in some societies, the artists are, are considered shamanistic that that they conjure the art in a way that ordinary people don't do you think that there's an element of that that puts people off that that magical aspect of it well um you probably don't know this but in my one in 1979 i i wrote about how art, art therapy is uh, is a manifestation of uh, of these worldwide continuities of it indigenous societies and, and communities throughout the world, uh, uh, AKA shamanism, which is an anthropological term for uh, uh, indigenous healing. And, um, and, and if you really dig into the basis of all of that, what they're, what they're, what they're doing is, is that illness uh, in, in indigenous societies throughout the world, and it's tricky to talk about indigenous societies because you know, there are people that say, oh, you're appropriating. And I, I just wrote another piece that I was asked to do about how, look, it, I just do, do what I do in my unique, you know, often uh, maybe even say idiosyncratic ways. But I study the continuities of world experience. This is uh, MC Richards, the great MC Richards, Mary Caroline uh, Richards wrote about in her book, Centering. Ideas cannot be possessed. They belong to the human community everywhere. And the, and the indigenous healing traditions throughout the world talk about uh, illness as a loss of soul. And the job of, of, uh, of the quote, uh, because these healers have different names in every community, uh, it's all other story. Sham, shaman's an anthropological term. Their job is to mobilize the community, always worked in groups, to, to support that restoration of soul, which is a transformation and bringing it back to the body and the community. So yes, there's a, 
great human uh, 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 tradition. Magic is yet a whole other term, a whole other name. I like the East Asian concept of chi, uh, uh, vital energy. I've written a lot about it in recent years and, and how that is the life force. I mean, it permeates uh, the great uh, traditions of China, the Chan Buddhism, the Taoist tradition, the Confucian tradition uh, of, of life energy and how art is, 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 is a manifestation of that life energy in the world. So yes, on, 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 on indigenous traditions everywhere. And you see that as, as I did in, when I uh, wrote this one essay in, I think it was 1979 from art shamanism, to art therapy and another one, once again, you know, Ili Iliade and my study support them, you know, looking at the psycho spiritual side, not the psycho reductionistic side. And, um, and, and another one called the Enduring Shaman. These traditions work with the creative transformative process, which we're still doing today in different ways. But the way in which indigenous communities used enactment, physical enactment, used the creative process, uh, uh, used rhythm. Uh, they, the drum is called the shaman's horse because it helped us travel between worlds. To, to release, to, 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 uh, to restore the life energy. And it works, art works, art healing works. I keep saying that it, it, you know, in arguing for art healing as a form of public health, you know, why isn't it being used everywhere? Well, it's because people resist, as I said earlier. And people don't understand it. People are constantly reducing it. So thank you. Thank you. And that question was asked by Helen Harrison, the director of the Pollock Crescent Study. Is, how did she say it? Hmm? How did she say the question? I'm sorry. Oh, well, that was Helen just asked. That was speaking. Helen. That was, yeah, that was who oh, asked. Oh, I, gotcha. I gotcha. Oh, and thank you so much. So um, who else has a question for Sean? About art, healing, Terrence Netter, or anything else? This, this is a this is a, 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 a bit of a strange era on, on this <laughs> in that uh, of, um, of putting everything into boxes which goes along with that diagnostic business and and this reduction this reluctance to look at those things that unite us as a human community with inf infinite uh, uniqueness of each being and of each place and of each each tradition. I'm wondering, um, Sean, can you go a little further with that idea? Like, what, I mean, when you say what unites us, and then what is sort of, in your opinion, what people are sort of promoting this idea that we're not united? Or could you just like explain a well, little bit? Well, the world. There are profound, as we know, profound divisions in our um, in our world today. There always have been. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, you know uh, who was it? Nietzsche is an eternal recurrence of the same, and um, and um, they concern me uh, because uh, in this uh, in, in higher education today there is uh, let's just say there's not much emphasis on the human community and those things that unite us as a, as a community. Um, and of, of course, I, I like to, to, to get at some of uh, all of these, uh, you know, these putting people into categories and separations, a lot of it coming uh, from very good intentions in terms of uh, those members of our community and in the communities within our countries and world that have been disparaged. And, and, and of course, uh, the work of, um, of liberation and, 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 um, and, and, and affirmation of people everywhere is an, is an, is an ongoing process. But there's, a, uh, uh, there's so much focus, uh, often with good intentions, on differences and putting people into these categories uh, that we that we fail to uh, to really look at uh, what uh, what what I always 
figured uh, uh, felt was was the truly liberal, the the truly left, the truly progressive. I think arguably some of those terms have been appropriated today of the of the universal human experience, mm -hmm. and with it infinite differences. I mean, you can have both. My mentor Rudolf Arnheim talked about the common pulse that we all have, but we're infinitely different, and, and, and there's nothing. There's nothing that empirically proves that better than art. Art, there are things that we share in the artistic process, but ultimately each piece is unique and that's the goal, mm -hmm. just as we do with people. And we, are, we, need, to, we need to get a little uh, less human centric and, and think about ourselves uh, together with the animals and the ocean that's outside this window and the sky and the, and the, uh, uh, the green life and the rocks as, 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 as all participants in a global, inter a planetary universe, Barry, uh, Barry would say universe interdependence that needs us all, that recognizes us all. And that, and then, then that we are complex. You know, I like, in this identity business, I mean, I keep, I've, I've said a lot for a long time, and maybe a lot of people agree with me. I, I, I can't describe to you who I am. This is my poet, uh, or what, what I am. My, uh, my poet uh, mentor here in Gloucester, the great poet Vincent Farini, uh, uh, talked about the I, the I, the, uh, the, the I, as he said, uh, this I, but obviously playing with the I cannot see itself. You know, enter the caves of other people. There you see me, who is yourself. We're all intertwined. This, 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 this new discourse on identity is deeply troubling to me. It's reductionistic. As Kierkegaard said, when you label me, you negate me. So I'm sorry if I don't want to get too political. I want to put it in a positive way. And uh, as I've always tried to do, uh, once again, how art embodies this. Mm -hmm. Infinitely unique but part of, as Arnheim said, that pulse of the human community. Well, I'm gonna ask you the question that uh, Terry asked uh, Lee Krasner. Well, when you look at Terry's art, how does it make you feel? Who was who this? Helen this is Harris. Helen. Oh, Helen again? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, um, the, I, I was surprised to see, um, uh, the, the more recent work, because we have been out of touch. And, and you know, I, I regret it with so many people in my life, how I, how I don't keep in touch. And um, I was really surprised at the later work. Uh, those three pieces at the end were ones that, um, that um, um, I, I sent to Joyce that I dug out uh, through uh, Terry's website. And those are the pieces that I remember so distinctly uh, 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 when we last were together in spring summer of 1968, and he had a he had a major show, as I said, at the Frank Wren Gallery. Those pictures I felt very strongly to be uh, to be connected to uh, and related to and building on Pollock's uh, Pollock's work. Those gestures I felt that very strongly. I'll never forget when I saw Autumn Rhythm in that year at the at the, at the Museum of Modern Art, and and then I was I was fascinated because I, oh, I I told you about how Terry talked about how he's fascinated about art healing and how his work tore him apart, how he turned to doing this contemplative reflection on nature. And I'm fascinated with that. And I'm going to have a conversation and I'm having an ongoing conversation with him about that, how he came, how he came to, he describes it as a, as a Buddhist uh, a practice, a contemplative practice, which is another of the major aspects of art healing, the contemplative witnessing uh, of, the, of, the, of the artistic expression. And as I write about, wrote about it in Art as Medicine, bringing that energy into our lives. So I'm fascinated with how he, how he, um, how he moved to contemplative reflection on nature, which is another huge part of art healing and those French landscapes. And I'm also intrigued with his, his, uh, his, uh, his reworking. Uh, I keep saying, I, you know, I'm a great admirer of Chaim Soutin. I, I'm a sort of organic uh, brute. Uh, I, try to, I try to get it, try not to be too fussy. And he, he, he used to always 
go looking for old canvases so he could paint over them because there's something magical that happens when there's something underneath. But, and I do a lot of painting over my own work, but my wife keeps going up to my street and said, leave those alone, I like those because it's a, it's a little tricky mm -hmm. in terms of painting over. But once again, it's just a remaking this. As, as he said in quoting Hegel, life reborn, nature reborn through the sensuous expression of the artist and Terry was constantly doing that rebirthing, that remaking, uh, that re as you say in the visit the show, revisiting, I call it remaking, reshaping. And it's, you know, it's constant. Once again, it's art healing. Art just models that process of how we have to then take what we do in our art, and as we say in the uh, classic homeopathic way, have it uh, have a direct physical impact on our lives. The remaking in our art is um, is in sync with the remaking of our own lives. And, and if we can live our our our, our lives like the creative process, there is a healing going on. But it can be rough, as he said. It can tear us apart. Mm -hmm. And that's the shamanic, uh, that's the shamanic, the Dionysian way. Dionysus was always, the, you know, the great, once again, we can't really, it's not hip to talk about even anything in the West, but, you know, the, the wonderful Dionysian Greek uh, uh, tradition of Dionysus being torn apart by the main arts. But if you really study those uh, traditions carefully, they always put them back together again. I used to describe how in my, my, uh, I, I led groups my whole life. I've hardly ever worked with people. That, I really don't work with people individually. I always work with people in groups and in community. And in, in the leadership process, Terry would know this, uh, especially in an open-ended group. I was very close to the Maxwell Jones, founder of the therapeutic community movement. And the, the, the leadership, you can get torn apart. And uh, I, I keep saying, I'm, you know, we're not, I'm, you know, I didn't talk about this, but I said 25 years being a dean and college provost and other kinds of things. And I kept saying that I have to open to that pain. And, you know, I remember Ronald Reagan being described as the Teflon president. He said, I'm not Teflon. I, I want it to stick. Sometimes the pain has to stick. I have to, I have to lose some sleep in order to remake my sense of what I'm doing and what needs to be done. To, to open to me to what I can't see as dreams do. But they're, once again, dreams, art, they're brilliant. They get past our defenses. Thank you, thank you. Hey, Helen, thank you for the questions. Thank you. So um, does anyone else um, desire some clarification on anything or have any comments or something you'd like to add? I'm wondering before we close, because I always like to help people find personal meaning in our discussions. Is there anyone who would like to share very briefly in like one or two minutes, how art has had a healing impact in your own life? Bring the topic to life with a specific, anyone? Well, I could share if no one else wants to. There's a few things you said, Sean. One is um, being universal and unique. And I think part of my own healing, you, I don't usually use the word, I like evolution and becoming healthier and happier as a human being, um, would be really realizing through art, a connection with other human beings. Because art is my language. It's a visual language. And um, I was so shy. And through art, I really was able to open up as a human being and share experiences that I never would have been able to verbalize and ultimately connect with people in a way that had meaning for me and other people. And um, in my case, I had a lot of early loss, which was really devastating. And I actually really did feel it's not like sort of a figure of expression, like, oh, art heals, art saves lives. Like it literally saved my life because that was what I could, it gave me a voice to, to, um, to articulate and put into a physical form all those inner experiences I was having 
which when I held them in, literally made me sick, like you had mentioned somewhere along your talk here about the loss of soul is sort of the loss of chi, it's the loss of energy when we repress and we don't know how to express and we don't know how to connect. And that to me is one of the beautiful things ultimately with art. We're actually creating something physical. It could be dance, it could be writing, it could be a painting or a poem. Um, but we're manifesting something that connects people. And um, yeah, you, know, you know, Joyce, I wonderful. Hear it enough. One, wonderful. Am I still on? Yes. That, you know, once again, back to Terry, that compassionate sense of the Buddha, of his core Jesuit background, to that compassionate sense and love for the other and love for the world and how art creates community. It always had. Once, once again, back to the indigenous healer. I just did a keynote to the Russian Art Therapy Association in the middle of all of the stuff. And I figured I had to go talk to them and be with them because um, these, these artists there, they're, you know, they're, they, believe me, it's hard, it's hard for them too. And, you know, art, art's not going to, to solve the problems of the world, but it's part of the ecosystem. It's something we can do when we, you know, it's something we can do. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I, in Trust the Process, I talk about the karma of simple acts. I really believe it, that when we feel helpless, art is something that we can do in response to the suffering of people everywhere. Absolutely. We just had a comment um, in the chat. Uh, this has been super. Thank you all. And I just ordered, perfect timing. I just ordered several of Sean's books. Um, wish we could have heard him talk with Terrence. Terrence is no longer with us. Um, I'll just have to imagine best wishes. And sorry, I have to leave early. That was Lisa Napoli, but yes. Lisa, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, you can purchase Sean's books on, um, you know, all the normal venues like Amazon and just Google Sean McNiff um, and the art of heal, uh, the trust the process, art of letting go. And that will bring you to all of his other books as well. And do you have a website, Sean? Oh, oh yeah, it's just, I what guess is just it? Google me. Uh, oops. I do okay. pop up on that internet. <laughs> yeah, I would like to say the biggest thank you. Let's give Sean McDip, our big, McNip, excuse me, our biggest round of Zoom applause. And Sean, it was so serendipity. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate, I'm going to like listen to this like, every day like could get inspiration it's really really great well well joy joyce you really articulated very well yourself <laughs> and, 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 I, and I, I really want to support what you're doing also as an artist an art educator or the adults children i really really want to support this work at the house thank you and thank you to helen harrison our director and um Teresa davis our assistant, and thank you to all of our Zoom participants who came as far as Japan. We have <laughs> Naomi here who gets up early in the morning to come to our Zoom, so I don't know how you do it, Naomi. But anyway, Sean, uh, thank you again. Have a wonderful evening or day wherever you are, okay? Yeah. And be well. Yeah. Uh, Teresa, if you're still there, boy, this is uh, pretty special to have you there. Therese, would you like to say a few words? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, I certainly would like to thank you so much for sharing um, your your experiences with Terry and your insights. And um, I stand in awe of your achievements and your um, your own evolution, if you will. Um, and I'm so delighted that art has given you this rich, rich life that you have. Um, the only thing I, I was going to mention is that um, you said you were, the, the, the later paintings of Terry were a little surprising to you. Well, um, the thing is when, when you knew Terence, you knew that he was a devotee of Hegel, of course, and he was very much inspired by the thoughts but he was also very in, uh, much influenced by Karl Rahner and the idea of um, being and the horizon. Now, Terence's life, his formative years were formed by the Jesuits. 
And in the same way you had an experience with him, he had an experience not only with the teachings of Ignatius, but with extraordinary mentors. Uh, you may have actually known some, Nori Clark is somebody I recall from Fordham. Um, but every decision Terry made was in the context of a search for his truth. And I don't know if that sits in, fits in with your theories, but when I look at his latest works now, and I am so thrilled to look at his earlier works, I love the drama. I love his color palette. I love the way he um, developed Fortage to create those works. But when I first saw his, uh, I'll call them landscapes, even though they're, he would not call them landscapes because he doesn't paint landscapes. I didn't, I couldn't imagine, I said, who did these? I didn't imagine that he did them. And he said he did, but it was like he, he was, he was in a period of his life where he was trying to meld all of the influences and come up with something that satisfied him and used the canvas to try to communicate that. Uh, to me, it was trying to get to the horizon. I could be all off about that, but that's how I like to think that he finally, um, he finally believed that there was something beyond the horizon. Well, that's beautiful. That's magnificent. Huh? It's too bad we couldn't have that when everyone was here. It was, it's well, so perfect. I keep saying, as I said to uh, Joyce, you say it better than me. <laughs> no, no, no. I, and I, I honestly want to tell or you. Or it's that, a community. It's an exchange. It's a, you know. But Terrence would have loved this dialogue with you. And he yeah. would be so excited about your thoughts. I know that. It, so it, thank you so uh, much. It's wonderful. Well, I'm uh, just, I'm, I, I can't tell you how, how, um, how deeply I um, feel. Uh, uh, almost to tears of you being here and, and him and the, and once again, this crazy serendipity, because it's that it his invisible hand is, is no woo woo thing that I'm talking. I mean, I believe all it, that. It's, uh, it's uh, really believe me, I would not have, nothing would have unfolded the way it unfolded if he hadn't. I hate that. I, I hate the way the word intervention is used in the therapy world today because it's too much about control. And I said, intervention is when, when people put themselves in between. But he truly did intervene at Fordham. And then and, and went to uh, Father McLaughlin, I guess, who was the dean then, a great person, and made it, it did the unusual thing. I mean, you know, of did that sending this kid life. down to the Art Students League. You know? And that, that, that's how it, be, you know. That's what he did. That's, he that, did. It would not have happened. Everything in my life, it would not have happened. I wound up like, making these huge, uh, you know, the huge minimalist paintings in a loft in Soho that Terry also hooked up set up for me to sublet for the the summer of 1968 but 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 I had this zen moment maybe I was ahead of him with the zen at the end when I was making these huge yellow canvases with white stripes and then white canvases with yellow stripes in the bottom that the next the next zen minimalist Barnett Newman move was to stop painting altogether I called my father and I went to law school for a year and a half before I dropped dropped out and uh, I came back to art and that's probably why we we had a little bit of a hiatus, but when I was reading about Terry and the catalog and other places about his thing about Rainer, uh, Reiner and um, and the um, uh, the um, uh, uh, the horizon, I, I kept thinking about Eugene O'Neill's Beyond the Horizon. Yeah. It's such a, uh, but in a way that Beyond the Horizon is part of the paradox because as the the Zen the, the Zen position that Terry was living as, as, as I understand later in his life you know wherever you go there you are we're right here there's nothing nothing but this present moment yeah 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 so well thank hello, you hello to all of you my name is uh, Anthony Francesi I'm Teresa's brother and Terence's hello, Anthony. and Terence was my uh, professor of philosophy at Georgetown just when he returned from uh, from Germany 
So first, let me just say, I, I don't know that I have anything to add to this conversation, except an expression of tremendous gratitude for my sister, her life, and her comments today, for Professor McNiff and your uh, remarkably insightful observations, of not, not only about Terrence, but about uh, the whole healing, the dynamic that, uh, and the spiritual dynamic that art does in fact uh, manifest. And of course, Joyce and Helen, uh, just remarkable, uh, sensitive, thoughtful uh, minds. So I first of all, thank all of you for all of this and for having put all of it together in this way. But I would, I would, I would just say that um, as a very, very immature mind, and probably an emo even more emotionally immature person at Georgetown, um, Terrence awakened in me the possibility of a life that was unimaginable. And I say this without any uh, uh, deprecation to my parents or to the life that I lived, but they were honest, hardworking, blue collar people. And I never, in my childhood ever had a conversation or bore witness to a conversation about ideas. Conversation in our home was always about practical matters or plans or explanations of something or other. And Terrence, one of the first things that he introduced me to was that conversations can be about three things, about things or about people or about ideas and it that i don't know how to say it i can only i can only communicate that to somebody who is young at heart the idea that he could say something so simple as that broke my broke the pattern of my life that, oh my God, ideas are okay. You can actually have, and you not only can have ideas, you can share them with other people and you can do things with. That began for me, my own personal dialectic and going back to the vocabulary that's been used throughout this afternoon. Yeah, I'll call you back. Art is reborn. It's nature reborn. Yes, in order to be reborn, it has to die. And as Hegel also said, there is no cognition until there is recognition. Nothing happens, the mind doesn't grasp it until the first perception is broken, destroyed, and then recognized. And so the creative process for me has always been in the Hegelian dialectic, the flower to the fruit to the seed, destruction but preservation destroyed but preserved on the ongoing dialectic. Terence did that for me, not intellectually, he did that to me organically, spiritually, so that in my life, I've made awful mistakes. I've been on, I've taken uh, self-destructive paths, but I was able always through the influence of his his spirit and he stays with me he is with me constantly i have i have come to love life to love my life because everything that was destroyed and everything that i participated in the destruction of was an opportunity to discover that I am a spirit housed in a changeable, malleable, fallible housing, but I continue on from my parents, my grandparents, from, the, from Jung's collective unconscious, I am part of a flow of something far more deeply interfused as dwelling as the light of setting suns in the round ocean, in the living air and in the mind of man. Um, so I owe that whole sensibility to Terrence, and I am so thrilled 
that the people here this afternoon know him and could share in that and could articulate it as well as all of you have so that I feel validated in that Terence is not my idea of a spirit. He is actually a spirit. And I know that in fact, because I hear it through you. So thank you all. Bless you, Anthony. Just, just magnificent. Thank you. Jeez, thank Joyce, you. I, I just hope you, you got these two. <laughs> Did you shut the recording off, Joyce? Oh, that was amazing. Anthony, nice to meet you, Tony. Uh, was so it, wonderful to meet you, Joyce. Was it, was and it I recorded? Completely... That, was un, that was so beautiful what you shared. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. He could talk about the dialectic and from Martin Buber and personal I and thou to the Hegelian dialectic. But We became very good friends. I, he was, I, I, he was my mentor, but I think we were also friends. He's certainly somebody that I loved and cherished. Um, but he embodied everything that he talked about when he told me and explained to me how he was going to the powers at Georgetown to say. I'm an artist. I need to be go be an art, do art. And he, I mean, they had I mean, just in just in material terms, they had invested quite a bit in this young man to go over to Germany and to study under Karl Rahner and to blah 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 he was blah. On the and he, PhD in philosophy route. Right? Absolutely, and, and came back and said, "Oh, but by the way, I think I want to go to the Corcoran and uh, do a, an MFA." Um destroyed yet preserved the i mean he was the dialectic and so i look at that that painting that joyce held up that some said looks like a kaleidoscope all of that is wonderful and all of that of course is expressive of the viewer as much as of the painting but i see in there a shattered glass I see fractioned, fractionated, destructive bleeding, what like, like a broken glass inside your brain. I see the fracturing of everything that originally was held to be coherent and true. And yet by doing it so sumptuously, and framing it so beautifully, it's okay. You know, that's, yeah. that's great, Anthony, because if, you know, if, another one of the fundamentals of the work I do is in keeping with what Picasso said about interpretation. Every time I go by that painting, we have a different conversation. Absolutely. Interpretations are responses. And that Absolutely. was magnificent what you just said, it, because it, it just it, it amplifies, enhances the conversation we're having right now. But no interpretation. This is what's wrong about the art and psychology history. Yeah. No interpretation is absolute. Right. Right. There's been this history of absolute. This means this. Interpretation is an ongoing dialogue. Uh, uh, Susan Sontag uh, wrote this wonderful book called Against Interpretation. Now, I'm very much in favor of the kind of interpretation that she's against, that Moby Dick means this. But <laughs> interpretation, citing Terry and Hegel, could be reborn. Absolutely. It's, you're, it's like you just did so beautifully. My God, that's incredible. What you said about the breaking. Mm -hmm. The Thank breaking you. to read. Uh... Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you again, Sean. And nice okay. to see you, Therese. And um, Tony, nice meeting you. And thank you for the people who stayed on. It's a, it's a testament yeah. to really how interesting this, this talk it, has it, been. Well, I enjoyed it greatly. So thank you.